with tonight's teaching, I want to introduce tonight's teaching by telling you a story about something that happened in my life a few years ago. And again, a few years ago, when this happened to me, I had already gone through so many awakenings through my life. I had already had the direct experiences of oneness that were all expressions of truth. And I had played my role, as I have through my life for my family, of, of helping people cross over. And I remember this story taking place uh, during the funeral for my father. And it was during the time where you as a family are invited to view the body. And I don't go to a lot of funerals, so a lot of this is kind of new to me. And my sister comes up to me and goes, it's time to go look at the body. And I thought, why? He's there, right? I mean, <laughs> what, what, what do we, no, we go look at the body. Okay. So we went up as a family to look at my father. And I looked at my father's body. And this, again, after all the spiritual realizations, experiences that I've gone through, here I am, a man, looking at the body of what used to be my father. And, and I'm just looking at a body that barely looks like my dad. And I looked at him, and I kind of studied it. And I realized what I've always known, but you know when you know something that goes just deeper, and it clicks, like in your gut. And, the, and the, what clicked for me was, what made my dad my dad is not in this casket. So for me, as I watched my sister and other family members doubled over his body crying, and I'm holding space for them. My experience was very solemn because my dad was more alive inside my heart than inside a body he once resided in. And what I realized was it is the life force energy or the consciousness that is alive within all of us, that makes every character who they are. And when that consciousness is done being in the body and it moves on, you look at the body as if who you spent so many years interacting with is not there anymore. So for me, the body wasn't the sign of my father is gone. It was the realization that the consciousness of my father has continued on to a different level. And my experience of death has never been that the people outside of me go somewhere else. It's almost as if the consciousness within me, and of course the consciousness of others, is the same consciousness. And it's as if outside people are extensions of my consciousness. And when their journey and my journey and our journey together reaches a certain point of completion, my dad doesn't go somewhere else. He dissolves back into the source within me. So it's as if the consciousness of my dad dissolved back into my consciousness as I'm going through this interesting play of staring at a body, a vessel in which he used to inhabit. And it was at that moment that I realized what I have always realized throughout my life, that it is the consciousness, the light within each of us that makes us who we are. The consciousness within us that makes us animated, that makes us unique, that makes us able to relate to one another. And without that consciousness, Form is just a shell. So when we hear of old teachings, and I, when I say old teachings, old teachings just need to be updated. It's not as if they're pointless and they never should have happened. So I just offer updates. Like for your phone. <laughs> An update. It's not that your phone is not good. It's that with an update, how much better will it be? 
also an update to a teaching, is that when we hear teachings that talk about life or the life of form is an illusion, it's not an illusion. It is the space in which consciousness resides. And because consciousness is what's animating all forms, all forms are an expression of that truth. So when you awaken the truth within you, there is no illusion to overcome. There is only truth to recognize wherever you go. And with that in mind, I want to provide you a teaching tonight. I'm probably going to hit on a lot of things and weave it together like I usually do. And the overlying message of tonight is that consciousness is everything. Consciousness is everything. Now, consciousness is always going through a never-ending journey of expansion, right? As long as consciousness resides somewhere, that form will grow and expand and evolve. Consciousness can help but expand, which means as long as consciousness is dressed up as people, people can't help but grow. And because consciousness is the governing force within our planet, this planet can't help but evolve, which is what's instigating this ascension process of global awakening. And what's interesting is that consciousness can help but grow, and the conditioning that we take on prior to the trajectory of awakening consciousness, conditioning can't help but look for more ways to maintain conditioning. So conditioning is trying to keep itself in its conditioned dream world state. Consciousness is always expanding into greater consciousness. And these two sides seem to collide and clash until the conditioning or ego within you recognizes your consciousness as its true living master and surrenders to that light. And until that moment of surrender happens, there is a carnival-like journey where we are running around doing all sorts of stuff, trying to figure out how to do all this right. And more than likely, what we're doing unintentionally is just reconditioning ourselves with just really clever spiritual ideas. One of the tenets of consciousness is that consciousness is always following the breadcrumbs of inspiration. It goes where it resonates. It goes where the excitement is. Now, e ego, on the other hand, conditioning, is always run by some form of competition. So awakening can be explained as the transition from competition mind into the inspiration of your heart. In competition, we think of, I want to be better than so-and-so, or I look at my field, uh, who's the top in my field? I want to be better than them. Competition needs someone else or something else for us to motivate ourselves to be better than. And even if you're not trying to be better than someone outside of you, even the competition that says, I'm going to be better than I used to be, even that is you competing with your own self, where you actually make yourself the hurdle you have to transcend, where you are actually trying to get over and away from who you used to be just to be better, but you can't actually become better until you bring all of yourself with you. Translation, that shit don't work. <laughs> It doesn't work. Inspiration works, where you say, I don't have to be over and beyond myself to be better than I've ever been, because I'm going to require all of myself and all of my consciousness to be inspired to be better than I could ever be. Inspiration says, I imagine this achievement and milestone, 
and it requires all of me to achieve it. I'm not trying to get over myself and beyond myself. I'm just being inspired to step fully into myself. And the reason why this is really important to decipher is because when we think about following the flow of inspiration, we also think about this thing about following our desires. But there's two kinds of desires. There's what your conditioning desires, and there's what your consciousness desires. What your consciousness desires are the choices that help your consciousness become more conscious. What your conditioning desires is any erroneous desire that keeps your conditioning conditioned. And I'll give you examples of what the difference is. So you can say, well, Matt, how do I know the difference? When you are following a desire that comes from your consciousness, there's a part of you that says, I think this would be really good for me. That's usually, that's almost the word by word phrase in your mind. So when you hear the soft, clear voice that says, I think this would be really good for me. Nine times out of 10, it's probably going to be an inspiration or a desire coming from your consciousness. One of the benefits of having an ego, and again, in the fifth dimension, in the new paradigm of spiritual evolution, we're not trying to act like we don't have egos. Egos, it's something we get integrated. When we look at how awake someone is, which, again, you can imagine, it's not very awakened to sit around and wonder how awake you are. <laughs> oh my God, how awake am I? Is there a chart I can look at? Is there a chart? Is there a chart? <laughs> like an article in like Cosmo? How awake are you? Take the test. Five simple questions. Oh my God. Gotta take the test. It's also not very awakened to call yourself awakened, because it just feels, uh, you ever, God, we get very excited when things like this happen, but the, the ego, the conditioning, starts to turn it into an identity, and it turns into, well, ever since I was awakened, and it just feels, ugh. But here's the benefit of having an ego, is that an ego helps you understand what are the desires of your consciousness. So your consciousness helps you by giving you a clue because it comes in that, I think this would be really good for me. And the ego confirms that that's a desire from your consciousness because your ego goes, ugh. Because <laughs> your ego looks at everything that's good for your conscious as boring, frustrating, lonely, that sucks, that's terrible. <laughs> and that's helpful. And you learn, you, you, you learn to function of like, oh wow, this might be good for me. I hear the chorus of hatred. I might want to do that. But when you don't have enough separation between you and your ego, you mistake the ego's descent for consciousness as if it's your aversion to it. And the more space we get, the more we're able to do what's really good for us, and over time, desire what is really good for us. And even if there's a part of you that's challenged, it becomes so little, and you go, oh, honey, it's okay. I know you don't like that. <laughs> and so the opposite question is, well, how do, you know, how do I know if a desire is from my conditioning or my ego? Because your ego's desire always has this very specific flavor. It's this race against time feeling. I want it, and I want it now. Very Veruca Salt <laughs> from Willy Wonka. Daddy, I want a golden goose now. <laughs> that's ego, that's the ego, the conditioning, wanting what it wants. If you talk to consciousness about a desire, it says, I want this. And the universe says, well, why? And you say, I think it would be really good for me. And I think it would really balance things out for me. 
Then the universe asks the ego, what do you desire? And it says what it wants. And it says, why do you want that? And the ego says, because if I don't get it, I'm going to die. Yeah. <laughs> the ego always puts things in very dramatic terms. <laughs> if I don't get a soulmate, I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm going to die. And it doesn't matter what it is. A soulmate. It, it, it's not even like the thing the ego wants is bad. It's that that's the thing the ego is using to keep you chasing. As if there's something else, someone else, or somewhere else to go where you're magically going to be happier than you are right now. That's what you wake up from. And the belief is when I get there, then I'll wake up from it. That's not how it works. Dreams just keep you dreaming. Clarity keeps you clear. So the difference is, is that your ego only wants what it doesn't have to keep it chasing something. And as long as you're seeking what you don't have, you're guaranteeing to keep your conditioning fed and active in a state of fight, flight, freeze, and various forms of bartering and negotiation. And then you think, what do I need to do spiritually to manipulate life to give me what I don't have? <laughs> what do I need to do? And in the, you know, all the things we talk about in the spiritual path are wonderful, but if it's co-opted by your ego, all the work you're doing becomes just like, it would, it would, it, if it's co-opted by your ego, it is like you doing a lot of work that doesn't actually go anywhere. It would be like you going to the gym, and then you get a text from your friend that goes, oh my God, please meet me home at 10 minutes. You're not going to believe this. And you think, oh my God, walking's going to take too long. I'm going to jump on this treadmill. And you get on the treadmill at the gym, and you put it to five, and you're like jogging. And you're like, it says I've gone three miles, and I'm only one mile from home. And you think the treadmill is a mode of transportation. And you're burning the calories as if you jogged home, but you've gone nowhere. So the ego is that which seeks and exhausts itself because the consciousness that is playing out conditioning is exhausting the conditioning so it can soften, let go of its grip, and let go to unleash the consciousness awakening inside of you. So when I say follow your desires, I don't mean this like a spiritual Las Vegas bender. <laughs> I mean, he said, follow my desire, so I should just go and do all these things and buy all these things. And, I, and when the ego is really active like that, it, it is like this ungrounded, frenetic energy. In the old spiritual paradigm, there was much time people needed to spend in ego before waking up was going to be instigated. And if you're going to be in an ego, you might as well have an inspirational one. So many years ago, the best place most people can get was just having a motivated, positive ego. And they'd come out like they went to a Tony Robbins event. They walked across coals. They broke boards. I can do anything. I mean, if you're going to have an ego, you might as well have a superhero one. Like my dad when he came out of seeing Rocky for the first time. It was awesome. I went with my dad to see Rocky. I've never been in a movie where people are standing up screaming at the screen. It was very exciting. And my dad walked out. We walked out, and I was just like, wow, that was incredible. And my dad, you know, and all these other men walking with my dad, and they just look like, yeah. Yeah, we, we could, yeah. I could do that, yeah. <laughs> I hope someone cuts me off when we go home. Yeah. <laughs> and just nuts on inspiration. If you're going to have an ego, have an inspired positive one. But we're at a time in history where we're waking up out of that, where we don't need competition, separation, biases, judgments, division. We don't need this to be individuals because we are one consciousness united. And even though the consciousness inside of you is the consciousness inside of all, 
it doesn't mean that the personalities of other people are your personalities. And that's a very clear distinction. Because another misunderstanding of the old paradigm is that we, we learn this teaching called life's a mirror. And we think that the shenanigans in other people's psyche is reflecting the shenanigans in our psyche. Right? You interact with someone, they're acting kind of strange, and you go, oh my God, they're showing me what's inside of me. The mirror teaching is really accurate if you are perceiving it as consciousness, meaning the light that animates your body and makes you this unique individual is the same power source inside every other body. Many bodies, one battery. But to imagine that you are this wind-up toy and all the shortcomings of all the other people is your shortcomings is now not unity consciousness. It's now going from, I used to identify with one ego, now I identify with all egos. It's a super duper ego. <laughs> like when I was a kid, I watched this cartoon called Voltron where these characters got in these little vehicles and they all connected and made this big super robot, right? That's when you become the Voltron of ego. But that's not what the teaching is. The teaching is other people's limitations are not your limitations. What you think about other people are the judgments you hold against yourself. And yet when you see clearly the light of heavenly perfection that is allowing these characters to act whether they're highest or their lowest is the same energy giving you the chance to live as you. So other people's density does not suggest anything about your density. It is the light of others that reflects to you the light that is the observer watching all of us. So life is a mirror if you know what's reflecting. And the old paradigm taught it in a very twisted way, and you would go, oh my God, I feel pretty all right, but I went outside, and I met some crazy ass people. So I gotta go home and do some shit. And it literally turned our inner journey into this weird codependent tailspin. Where you're like apologizing to every person for what they're doing. Like it would be like if you were in a store and someone was rude to you and you go, oh my God, I'm so sorry I created you that way. <laughs> What's that about? That's like someone going, you know, it's like in the moment of exasperation of something unexpected happens and you go, I guess I chose this. You ever heard that one? Do you remember being in heaven choosing this? No, no one does. I actually dialogued with someone. I said, do you remember being in heaven choosing this? And they go, yes. And I said, no, you don't. <laughs> That's completely untrue. You don't remember. You think you did because you believe this superstition. I said to them, you think you must have chosen it because it happened. But just, under, just hear me out. You didn't choose any of this. But the one who did create all of this is you. But it wasn't with the will of choice that you have as a person that chose all of this. Like I've done before in videos, you don't remember looking through the catalogs up in heaven going, you know, it'd be really funny <laughs> if I was super needy and my, and my parents were emotionally unavailable. Hey, heaven, you got that in stock? You got that in stock? 
You seem to be out of lottery winners. I wanted that one first off, right? That's the first one to go. You're in front of heaven. What would you like? Welcome to heaven. What would you like to create for yourself? Lottery winner, add to cart. Sorry, out of stock, of course. So what do you have available? That's like going to a shoe store, right? You know, you ever ask for shoes and they, here's the funny thing about shoes. They never tell you they don't have the one you're looking for. They bring you back five you didn't ask for, right? Hey, I would like sandals in a size seven. And they go, well, I was thinking maybe you, should, you would like to see these orthopedic shoes. I really would not. How about moccasins? Nope. Cowboy boots. And heaven goes, well, what's available is that all your friends will be athletic and you'll be five foot one with asthma. <laughs> They're all gonna peak in high school and you're gonna be hilarious. <laughs> okay, sure. You didn't choose any of this. You just agreed to be here. You wanted a journey. And the journey was let me experience myself from my lowest to my highest capacity and let me be an individual expression of the divine. And because of our conditioning, when the going gets tough, we go, I don't like being this character. <laughs> and it's like you being an arcade going, I don't like this game. I want to start all over. So I'm just going to stop playing until this character dies. <laughs> and we abandon ourselves. But you cannot abandon yourself because the character you have a varying opinion about is the consciousness of the universe. And what you think about others registers in your subconscious mind as a judgment toward yourself. And what you register as a judgment toward yourself becomes the way you're more than likely to view others or the world. That's the relationship. So if you don't want to have a tendency to see other people as less than divinity, we don't judge ourselves. And when we don't judge ourselves, we're able to see people's light while also knowing that everyone's growing into their light. They're not maybe their highest masterful self. They're still a work in progress. Kind of like you may have a very challenging time with a kid you went to school with, but there's no reason to judge the adult them because that adult self wasn't there when that problem occurred. So everyone's growing into their potential. And when we talk about the evolution of consciousness, there's a very specific word that is going to quickly become more useful as we go along. And it's a word called integration. I know a lot of you are involved in my total integration program, and it's because it's not a matter of how much healing and work you've done. It's not a matter of how many awakenings you've had. How much of all that have you integrated and are embodying? And over the course of history, whether we look at people who have done really distasteful things to rob other people of their rights and cause pain and various forms of abuse, we look at the news and we're horrified by the things we see. Or even you hear stories of like a supposed enlightened master who behind the scenes is not acting out the consciousness of their highest ethics and ideals. That isn't a matter of, oh, they're awake. Nope, they're not awake. It's a matter of how integrated is that consciousness? And when consciousness is awake and integrated, Someone knows who they are, and their choices are a manifestation of their highest wisdom in action through their words, responses, and behavior. So what's an easier way to look at life is everyone has insight. Some people seem to have a lot of insight. And while it's good to listen to things that resonate with you, one of the most important things you can do to really honor the potency of a teacher is watch their behavior. How do they talk to people? 
How do they talk to you? What are the kind of choices they're making? And not as a judgment, as an assessment. Because there are a lot of people who have wisdom, and they may not have gotten to the embodiment part. Right? And, and if you're like, well, how do I know where these kinds of teachings are so I can circumvent them? It, they're called, God, what is that word? C cult. Cults. <laughs> It becomes a cult. Have you ever seen that? Spiritual community, we're all together, love and light. Let's get together and raise the vibration. All well-meaning. While listening to someone who's trying to make every person the same, like a robot. I don't want you all to be the same. I want you to be yourself. I want you to be an individual. I want you to be a free thinker. I just want to help you become your best, most loving, powerful self. Right? Thank you. People over the years with my reputation, as, and I say that as a positive reputation, I have a very positive reputation, and it's because I am what I teach. To the degree that there have been times I've channeled teachings two years in advance that I haven't taught because there were certain things I needed to do to embody it before I taught it. But of all the things that, ooh, <laughs> of all the things that precede me with my posit positive reputation, what I'm very proud of as, as a reputation I carry is probably being the world's worst cult leader. <laughs> I'm the worst. Because I don't want you all to be the same, and my job is only to help you become the master that you are. I already know my power, and I demonstrate and celebrate my power by how I help you in the name of love. And so when we talk about integration, we have to look at, in our own lives, how am I acting upon and making choices from the inspiration of consciousness within me? Am I willing to always do the right thing even if it makes my ego uncomfortable? Am I, am I allowing myself to make the choice that says I would rather be physically uncomfortable while doing the right thing than to ever diminish the light in another person? That's when character wakes up in you. Right? There's, I've lived my life as a character. And then there's, I once thought I was a character until I became the character of my highest consciousness. And in every moment, this is really the game life is playing with you. Life and you are co-creators in this. What's life's role? Life's role is saying to you, do you agree to come down to earth and be a part of this journey? Little mafia. And you go, hey, so if you can tell me what's going to happen. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, what's going to happen? Stuff's going to happen. <laughs> Beginnings, endings, bada bing. <laughs> don't worry about it. You're going to love it. Starts, finishes, beginnings, endings, stuff. And then you come down here, and when you get under the rules of integration, you go, life's job is to create the greatest scenarios where I am going to be put into positions where the only answer is choosing the inspiration of my consciousness. And if I don't, I'm going to continuously recycle my conditioning, and life's going to get more stressful, heavy, dense, and daunting. So the rules of engagement as co-creators is that life's job is to take care of outcomes, put you into synchronistic moments, to script all the characters in your life to be the wind-up toys that say the things they do. And your job is to ask yourself the question, what would consciousness do? Or what would love do? But I don't say in this, in this teaching, what would love do? Because some of us have this idea of love that Love is like this altruistic energy, or if I'm loving with my family, I'm going to get eaten by wolves. They're going to think I'm weird. Or that 
the loving thing to do is to be walked over by people. Like being loved means people treat me like crap and I'm okay with it. That's not love. Love is badass. <laughs> love is badass. Love is so badass. And love is consciousness experiencing the thrill ride of its own self-actualized inspiration. When that starts to happen, love says, hey, I don't care what the other people do. They can say whatever they want. They can choose whatever they want. I have my own will. I decide how I respond. I don't follow their script. I'm an improv artist. <laughs> They're having a bad day. I may not be having a bad day. I don't apologize for it. And if they're going to act in a way that is cruel and ridiculous towards me, well, this is life showing me someone I perhaps can afford to spend less time with. <laughs> Imagine hanging out with someone and you go, you know, I think the universe just gave me an intuition that says I think we would be better off evolving by spending less time together. And they say, <laughs> How did you get that intuition? Did it just fall from the universe? Did your guide tell you it? Did it come from your central channel? Did the Akashic Records give you a vision? No, no, no. I've just been aware of how you're speaking to me and I'm horrified. <laughs> and it feels like crap. And so I looked at my watch and I said, you know what? I got shit to do. Because when you spend time around people who mistreat you, you are in a negotiation with their conditioning. You're in this competitive debate-like standoff where you need someone else's permission in order to be whole and complete. And the more time you spend with people that are competitive and judgmental and obstinate, the more your own flow of inspiration will seem invisible to your senses. So we have to get over this, oh, I can't just leave, that wouldn't be loving. It would be to you. And you're the only one in which your will affects. So when you stay in relationships, and it doesn't matter what relationship it is, and of course I would say, the most difficult one to deal with because all of us are in different life circumstances. It's difficult when the one treating you poorly is your child. And so I'm, when I'm saying what I'm saying, I'm not saying it as if it's going to be easily applied to every situation and scenario. But by and large, when we're talking about romantic relationships, when we are an adult relating to our family and we're no longer these children, who see the insanity of your family and you try to call out the inconsistencies and they go, by the way, we make the rules here and if you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. And you go, oh, I'm in, I'm in prison, I get it. I get it. The birthday gifts threw me off. <laughs> I thought you cared for me and now I realize that you, instead of liking me, you just like controlling me. Oh, I get it. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. Back to solitary confinement. I'll go play my Nintendo. <laughs> but when you're in a relationship as an adult, and you are around people whose consciousness is not ready to awaken, and is fighting their own awakening by picking at and fighting with and dominating you, your job is to remove yourself from that volatility so you have more space for inspiration to guide you. And when you get that feeling of like, I can't be okay until they're okay with my choice, that's when you have started to uncover the codependency that makes you the accomplice to the criminal behavior being projected onto you. Because someone who is fighting awakening to stay unconscious has no power. They need to partner up with the power of your consciousness to pull this trick off. Imagine being in a situation where someone's abusing you and the other person is making sure you can't leave. 
And then one day you realize the person blocking you from escaping is you. Consciousness knows when to open up to something and consciousness know when it's time to leave. And in your highest consciousness, there is not that residue of subconscious codependent remorse where you're trying to protect the other person who is treating you poorly. You're trying to protect their feelings from their own evolution and we're turning away from ourselves. It's so weird when you start to look at how am I being an accomplice to the crimes committed against me and how am I spending more time caring for someone else's feelings than listening to my own? Because the truth is, whatever is good for you is good for the other person. They may not know it. They don't have to know it. What would consciousness do? What is the impulse of consciousness? Two words in every moment. Consciousness always has the impulse of getting real. That's why people in egos don't like having these come to Jesus conversations. Where you set someone down and go, we need to talk. And they go, w -w -w why, why, why would we go talk? Because their ego is already sensing, oh, shit, something's up. <laughs> And the manipulation becomes when you have a come to Jesus conversation and say, here's what the deal is. Have you ever had this experience? Where the minute you go to leave, that person becomes a different version of themselves. They're on their best behavior, trying to now win you back. Why? Because their mind is rooted in competition. They're about to lose you. They got to win you back like you're a trophy and a prize. And all of a sudden, no, 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 don't go. Oh, I can change. Look, I just changed. I just changed. <laughs> Look, I just changed. <laughs> and they'll even manipulate. You yourself told me that I was capable of change. I just did it. Wait, just did it again. <laughs> Look how good I am at this. And you go, wow, they changed. I guess that were okay. I guess, I guess, I guess we're okay. And then wait a couple days. <laughs> And the same shit happens again. And that's when your consciousness says, the impulse of expansion is getting real. Not getting real with someone else, getting real with you. And the way you recognize egocentric behavior, egocentric behavior is nothing but repetition. And the game of egocentric consciousness is someone acts in an unmindful, unlawful, unkind pattern of repetition, but every time they do, they have new and creative reasons. And all you have to do to see through the smokescreen of ego is just notice repetition. It happened once. Okay. I'm on notice. It happens again. That's very interesting. And it happens again. And the more times you watch that repetition happening, you are more likely to stay and be the accomplice to someone else's crimes against you and to spend more time trying to protect their feelings then rescue your own innocence. So in this day and age, where we are simultaneously experiencing a rapidly awakening consciousness in the world, along with more opportunities to fall asleep than ever before. That's where we're at right now. <laughs> and not to plant, put the blame on anything, because I don't blame anything, because it's not anything that puts you to sleep. It's just using something to put yourself asleep. Do you know what is the easiest thing to use to fall back asleep? Technology. Just not on YouTube. <laughs> Hi, YouTube. Not you. Watch this. It's good. This is good. But Matt, 
are your videos still what you're talking about? No. No. Just the other videos? Yeah. The other videos. <laughs> because when an ego is using something in a co-opted, unconscious way, the repetition is very intense. And you know that you are being victimized by repetition or something's being used against you instead of for you. Because when you're doing it, at first your ego gets very excited. So there's like an elation. And you can confuse the ego's elation for getting high off conditioning as if it's your soul's expression of joy. But as you keep being exposed to repetition, you'll notice your heart will race. And that's when you know, hmm, this is good for me, but I don't think I'm using it the right way. Like a lot of you will say to me, oh, I watch your videos every day, which is awesome. Keep doing that. Amazing. But, you know, hey, Matt, should I watch your videos for five, ten hours a day? Probably not. So we break up repetition with mindfulness. Mindfulness is the ability to use your intuition to know there's always a time and place for everything. And we don't turn something into a repetitive form of conditioning. So when people are mistreating you in your life, you'll see it by repetition. When you are using something that's not good for you, you'll notice the repetition. And that's how we start to see through ego consciousness. And what breaks that spell is the impulse of consciousness, which is get real. And getting real starts with I do a lot of the same things every single day, imagining that different things will happen. We all know the Albert Einstein quote, I don't need to say it. We all have the calendar, the poster. It's a very good quote. But that's what happens, repetition often when co-opted by the ego doesn't lead to new things. Repetition, when utilized by consciousness, creates a reconditioning process. But in order for you to recondition yourself and to decondition yourself from what you absorbed and inherited from your family, you have to be aligned and integrated. So what, the reason why in the next so many years of this new spiritual paradigm, words like integration are going to be so important, is it's not like by doing this repetition I become integrated. It's that you must first come into the alignment of integration. So whatever you spiritually do through repetition is expanding you instead of limiting you. Everyone is one consciousness, but everyone is at various levels of self-realization, embodiment, and integration. The actions of other people do not reflect what's unprocessed in you. What's unprocessed in you are all the reasons, excuses, and beliefs that keep you knowing what to do and waiting for a more convenient time to do it. Yeah, I should really leave this relationship. That's what I should do. It's Arbor Day. <laughs> if I leave on Arbor Day, I'm taking the attention away from the trees, and don't they really deserve a day to themselves? I that would be so that would be so selfish of me, right? Then you go the next day. Okay, today's the day. Today's the day. I know this is the day. I need to leave. I hear Celine Dion singing the song. It's time to go. <sighs> Chinese New Year. <laughs> or Boxing Day for Canada or whatever. And you, there always comes down to this repetition of, yeah, I would have done it, but that's the opposite of getting real. Getting real says, I know what I need to do. I'm scared out of my mind. This is not convenient. I may fail. This may not work out. And this is certainly not anything on my vision board whatsoever. 
but I would rather be anywhere else than exposing myself to the toxicity that is stunting my growth. You have to get to the place that says anywhere but here. And the question is, how much repetition do you have to be suppressed by before that starts expanding in you? Because the definition of heroism, the definition or recipe of what it means to be a hero, if you ever have seen an interview with a hero on the news from a five-year-old child who saved his little sister to a man who rescued children from a burning building, what's the thing every hero says? They, they ask them, what gave you the strength and conviction to do the, the almost unimaginable thing you just did to help people? And they said, I had no option. I had no option. And do you want to know what keeps you from stepping into the role of your hero and bringing your superpowers to life? Because your superpowers will be activated when you do something courageous with no other option. And what gets in your way is an illusion called choices. <laughs> the AC that is now blessing us with cool air, do you know what gives it the ability to cool us off? It had no other option. No other option. And so it's really quite an illusory concept or, or, or predicament in, in, in our human evolution is that we think if we have more options, we can absolve the, uh, ourselves of the fear of missing out, right? Isn't that the big fear, FOMO, fear of missing out? I can't even call it that, by the way. I think I'm too old for that. <laughs> if I say FOMO, I want to like arrest myself or something. <laughs> Call the millennial police on me, please. Come get me. I said a word I shouldn't say. <laughs> There's certain words I can't say. I'm too old. I know I'm only in my, mid my 40s, but certain words I can't say. FOMO, I can say the fear of missing out. I can't say lit, can't say that at all. Dude, that was lit. I can't say that. I was raised in the 80s and 90s. That was awesome. If I say that, you know what I mean. Wow, there's something Matt liked. Someone came up to their day, dude, I watched your video, it was lit. You, you, you like the lighting? My energy was bright? Anyway. <laughs> so funny. But there's a fear of missing out. And we believe that more choices means I'm not going to miss anything. But then you start looking at all your options and you're surveying, and you're going to get into the ego's tailspin of competition. How? Because competition, the most subtle form of competition, is called comparison. And you're comparing and contrasting. Should I take showcase showdown number A? Bunch of new furniture. You watch prices, right? Showcase number A, furniture. Meh. Hmm. Who wants that showcase, right? Grandfather clock, who cares? <laughs> right, then the last minute, a trip to Tahiti. Oh my God. Then the next showcase showdown, five cars or whatever they're going to give away. And you're comparing and contrasting from a mindset of competition that say, which one is going to make me not miss out on the most things? And then you go over here and you go, but now I'm going to miss out on this. What about the grandfather clock? <laughs> and you're evaluating your choices back and forth and not choosing anything. Because the ego, when your soul makes a choice, your ego has a mini death. Because if you choose one thing, what the ego sees is all the other things you didn't choose are things you must be missing out on. It would be like going to a restaurant and choosing one thing for dinner and then grieving all the things you're going to miss out on tasting. <laughs> so the biggest illusion, and if there's any kind of manipulation trying to be used to keep you asleep, it's that if, if people who think they're in power can keep giving you nothing but options, 
you're going to have so many things to evaluate. You're not going to make the right choices you need to keep expanding, and you're going to be controllable. You're controlled not through options, but through the availability of options. And the greatest way to perpetuate the hypnosis of options is with technology. Anything you want access to, like that. Oh, you can't get it that fast with this app? A new app, you can get it faster. I can get it faster? I can get it faster, right? You can order something on Amazon and some flying robot drops it off at your house or something. <laughs> Have you ever seen this? Try to order something on Amazon and it says, delivered by today. <laughs> How the hell is that gonna happen? And again, technology is wonderful. It's what connects us. I'm on you, uh, this video will be on YouTube. It connects us all, all over the world. A lot of us came to know these teachings through YouTube. Now we're here in person. Please join us in person, YouTube. Come on. Come on. But through the expansion of technology, you have so many abilities to customize your settings on apps, social media, your phone. People have no time to call people and let them know how much they love them, but they have time to customize bit emojis. <laughs> hey, Mad, look what I did today. It's me on a horse. <laughs> look, it's, it's me with a jetpack. And the more options we have to customize our settings, the more we are turning away from the choices that guarantee our inspiration and expansion and the embodiment of our soul's highest perfection. There's nothing wrong with technology. I have a smartphone. I use technology. I'm on social media. I'm probably on social media five minutes a day. Maybe 10 minutes, five minutes, I post. Later that day, I go back, I see all the comments, I press like on every single one of them because I send a blessing to every person who posts on my page. I spend 10 minutes a day on social media. I've never customized a single setting, ever. I don't know what half my phone even does. <laughs> I was walking around my apartment the other night, and I heard this noise, and I go, what the hell is that? And I pulled my phone out. My phone was FaceTiming someone. <laughs> is it now intuitive? Do I need to talk to this person? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Again, technology is wonderful. Technology is wonderful when the consciousness in you is navigating it. But when it's being run by that unconscious pattern of repetition, it's just something to get lost in. And I'm sure you've seen this cultural shift that has happened, right? The, the, the first shift was like 13 years ago when we discovered this thing called reality TV, right? And everyone lost their mind, and all of a sudden, we don't want to watch actors on TV. No, no, we don't want to watch people that have worked hard to be talented at their craft. We want to watch people who don't know anything about theatrics, and we want to watch them have conversations that are made up and call it reality. That was, one, that was like one sign of the apocalypse, right? <laughs> and then the next sign is this new wave of customize your settings. Just stare at your phone. Sit at dinner with people. No, no, don't look at them. No, 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 don't look at them. No, no, don't. No, look at your phone. Look at them through your phone. <laughs> Have your bit emoji talk to their bit emoji. No, don't use your words. Just send a text. I've, I've been at dinners looking, and there's two people texting back and forth at the same table. And, when, and what's interesting is that when we live, and again, it's not the, it's not the, it's not the um, 
it's not technology that's necessarily doing it. It's how fast companies are working to constantly make technology advancing at a very unnatural rate of speed. And you always have to catch up. You got the iPhone 10, now you need the iPhone 11. Oh, your iPhone has a camera, mine has three now. Why do I need three cameras? Why do I need three cameras? I only have one personality. Why do I need three cameras? Oh my God, I had 10 filters on my camera and now I have 85. Why do I need 85 filters? And what this does is when companies are trying to keep technology expanding at a certain rapid rate, to keep up with technology has to come with a sacrifice. And the sacrifice is going to be that you are going to lessen your practice of social interactions. And you're going to get rusty at communicating and you're going to rely on your relationship with your phone instead of your relationship with life. And if you think the pixelation on your phone is brilliant and vivid, look at this screen. This is like an IMAX screen. This is huge. This is like beyond HD. This is magnificent. So when we're talking about the acceleration and expansion of consciousness, creating a tipping point for the awakening of our civilization, it's where we are surrendering the need to compete, whether it's trying to divorce yourself from your previous self to be better, whether it's trying to be better than other people, whether it's deriving false power out of other people's shortcomings, or whether it's even the comparing and contrasting of your options and choices and never getting around to the things that are really good for you. Really what is required is to turn towards the impulse of consciousness which is the willingness to get real. And to see through the facade of repetition that says, hear my blessed, beloved, beautiful ego, right? We're not shaming the ego. We love it. Oh, but I love you, ego. However, I am on to the fact that you keep telling me things I don't have trying to convince me that I'm deficient because I don't have the things I don't have. Only so I can run towards that thing, and as long as I'm seeking what I don't have, the expansion of my consciousness is suppressed. So we stop, we put our phones down, And in order for us to start becoming the hero of our soul's journey, we realize that in order for you to pinpoint the most courageous option for you to choose in any moment, you have to give yourself less options. The ego does not want to hear anything about that. So if you say, I don't know where my ego is, well, I'll help you. You're going to be more courageous if you had less options. Now you just feel for where the groan comes from or where the fear of missing out comes from. And you go, oh, that's my ego. I thought that was me. No, it's just a small version of you. And if you think being the smallest version of you is painful, try meeting who you really are. Because who you really are doesn't actually need more than one option to follow the flow of inspiration. What's the definition of inspiration? Out of nowhere, an idea or a direction struck me and I had to go in that direction. When people are inspired, how many options do they have? One. In order to feel whole and complete, what does your ego need? More than one option. There's the difference. It's easy for me to follow the intuition of the universe because I'm only given one directive at a time. Go there. Okay. Okay. 
And the best the ego can do to try to slow this expansion is you get the directive, go here. And the ego says, why? Why, which seems like give me a reason, is fishing for two. Go here. And so a lot of times people will say, Matt, I know I have intuition, but how come I can't hear it? because you are still in the mindset where you need more than one option. When you get to the point of saying, hey, what I want is great, that's wonderful, but I don't need anything but the will of the universe to guide me, show me the way, and the universe goes, do that. That's where the rubber hits the road. And every time you follow the inspiration of that one directive, you are expanding your consciousness, you are following the flow of inspiration, and you are absolving out of your energy field the competition and comparison of a conditioned, old, outdated paradigm. And the question becomes, as a co-creator of your reality, life has already created outcome, life has already created scenario, life has already created Characters, location, motivation, choice, opportunity. And all you have to do is allow yourself to be inspired to do the one thing that a very small part of you resists doing. But when you do something that a small part of you resists, it's one step into a much bigger, more courageous you. It doesn't mean you have to always throw yourself out of your comfort zone and, you know, walk on coals and chop, karate chop wood in half or whatever people do at some seminars. All you have to do is know what's good for you. And what's good for most of us is less options less options. Even like in sales, you go to buy a car, someone's selling you a car. You go to buy a house, someone's going to sell you a house. In sales, you're always taught, my dad was a salesman his whole life. In sales, you're taught no matter what someone's needs are, always, bringing some, always bring something else. Why? Just in case. Just in case of what? Like you go in a car lot and they say, hey, welcome to Ford. Yeah, I'm looking for a Ford, this model, and these specifications. Well, we have that right here, but let us also show you this. Why? No. Just in case. It's almost a rhyme. Just in case is an option that's fear-based. Just in case what? just in case you're gonna miss out on something. How can you ever miss out on something you're meant to experience? The truth is, every one of your desires are gonna manifest. It's just not gonna manifest at the exact moment that you desire it. So no one's gonna miss out on anything. We just have to learn to follow the inspiration that is never more than one simple directive. Do this. And you ask your guides, hey, what do I do about this relationship where I'm treated like absolute crap? Well, you should leave. That's one directive. Where do I go? And then the universe shows you a map. And it says, here's where you live right now, and puts a big X through it. Go anywhere else. <laughs> You'll even take scissors and cut out that circle. Here, now go anywhere. Here's a map without the place where you are currently. Go anywhere else. Anywhere else but where you're at being treated like crap. One inspired choice. And even if it's temporary, you have to be able to do what you need to do to make sure that you are surrounding yourself with people who are respecting you. Because when you're surrounded by respect, your consciousness has no other choice but to expand.
And because our egos are afraid of the unknown that comes with expansion, there's a subconscious secondary game that says, let me surround myself with people that treat me like crap and let me gossip and judge them with my other friends. Can you believe they talk to me like that? And I'll stay in this situation so I can keep myself judging other people, deriving false power from their shortcomings while hiding from the unknown that I don't have the courage to step into. Fuck that. It's such a weird thing to see. Have you ever, maybe you or someone you know, have you ever seen someone who's totally in a toxic situation and they blind themselves from what they need to do and instead they just want to judge and denigrate their victimizer? When you judge and denigrate your victimizer and stay put, you're now their accomplice. You're a part of it. So at the very least, when we follow the flow of inspiration that is the expansion of your consciousness, at the very least, you're no longer an accomplice to the crimes committed against you. And then at a certain point, you become the source of inspiration that is orchestrating synchronicity and opportunity that is coming your way because you're in the right mindset, which is I only need one option and I use the inspiration of my heart's resonance. I use my emotions and my feelings and what feels right in my guts, and I follow that no matter what. I don't follow a path based on the judgment of my mind that filters through the perception of my experience. I could close my eyes and find my destiny by following the direction that my body inspires. And when you start awakening in consciousness, there be becomes this pressure where you can't not choose the highest choice and get away from it. When you don't choose what you know you need to do, things get really, really, really stressful. Like not paying your monthly rent and squatting in a unit and they turn the heat off, they turn the water off, it's gonna get rough until you leave where you don't need to be. And as you start to step into this flow of inspiration and you say, I'm not just gonna do what other people in my life do, right? That's a very socialized form of ego, right? What keeps us from being courageous is not a lot of people around me seem courageous, so I'm just gonna do what they're doing. Or you can break the mold. I don't fit into molds, I break them. I've broken every mold I've tried to fit myself into. I don't fit in any mold whatsoever. And I can't be molded in any specific, predictable way. And neither can you when you wake up. And as you start to step into the glory of self-realized consciousness, you start to realize the power of two, let's call them koans. Have you heard that term koan is like a spiritual phrase that when you hear it and take it in, it has the power to activate your consciousness. And if you think of it too much, it's gonna blow your mind up. So here are the two statements that become the instigators of your expanded consciousness to give you the power and the courage to follow the inspiration, to follow what feels right. In the old days, we would say, follow what feels good. Remember that teaching? But follow what feels good can be a judgment of comparison coming from your ego. Oh, wow, I drank that whole bottle of wine. I felt great. <laughs> I think this is good for me. I like being spiritual. <laughs> See how it can get co-opted? It's not just following what feels good. And again, it's important to feel good, but we feel good by doing what's right. And what's right is what's good for you. And you know what's good for you and you know what's not good for you. 
you know. So here are the two phrases that help you to get into this trajectory of expanding consciousness. Because we're all starting to get onto consciousness is everything, but I want to move you into a trajectory of consciousness is the everything that you are. Be the everything that is consciousness. So here are the two phrases. We'll do them one at a time. And I didn't even realize these two koans until someone in my life asked me a question. And it was very interesting. That's how I often download things. Someone asks me a question, catches me off guard, something comes through, and I go, I'm going to teach that. And someone asked me recently, said, what are two things you live by? Well, that's interesting. I've never been asked that question. And the first thing I said is, I am the only one in my world who needs to be awake. President, all that, anyone. And I only say president because, and again, a lot of you hear me on these videos, and I even know there's people who, you know, people don't like the president, some people like the president. Whatever your opinion is, I'm not a political person. I only mention it because it's in the field. It's in the quantum field, it's up for people, and I just say it because it's relatable. I have no opinion either way. I'm here cheering on and championing consciousness. I don't have opinions about characters. It's inconsequential to me because every character is like a wind-up toy doing the very repetitive thing that triggers expansion in every person. So if someone says, Matt, what do you think of Donald Trump? Let him wake you up. Let him wake you up. Donald Trump is making a hero out of all of us. Donald Trump acts upon a place of he does what he does because he doesn't have a choice. And you're going to be a hero in response to that when you don't have a choice to act the way you need to act. A villain always creates a better hero. So if you see a villain in that kind of a character, let him bring the hero to life in you. That's the only justice there is. It has nothing to do with him. It's a role that character is playing. But you are the only one who has to be awake in your reality. That's, the, that's what I live by. I don't need anyone to be awake. I mean, that's the gift I give you is every time we're together, your conscious awakens and I'm helping to shepherd this process. I don't require anyone to be awake in my life. In my personal life, I don't have conversations about awakening. I have conversations about laughter and about pain because that's actually what I'm interested in, the comedy and tragedy of being a person. And the more awake you are, the more incredible of a person you're going to be. But I want to hear about your gains and losses, your wishes and disappointments. I want to hear about what makes you laugh until you cry. And I want to know what reduces you into a puddle of tears, because that's what's real. The ability and willingness to be here under all terms and conditions. I'm the only one that has to be awake in my life. Because as an awakened being, and I'm just saying that as a reference point, I have the tenacity to grow and become better as a result of anything. And the more awake you are, the more resilient you are, and the faster you recover, and the better you become. And you're not afraid to love, and you're not afraid to lose, you're not afraid to have yourself trip and fall face first into the center of the Grand Canyon. You will pick yourself up, and you will be better than ever before, and you will live the tale of the tale that inspires other people who are too afraid to follow the flow of what is calling them home. I don't need anyone to be awake. I don't need my partner to be awake whenever that person decides to show up. I don't need my world to be awake. I don't need clerks at stores to be awake. I don't need politicians to be awake. That for me, is completely besides the point. The only one who has to be awake, me. I've placed my bets, all money, on this character. And I wish the world the best of luck. That's where you have to get. Because otherwise, 
And God forbid you have a belief that says, I need to make sure I have a really spiritually aligned partner because then they'll be the person that never leaves me, right? No, they're going to do the same thing your other partners do, just with spiritual ideas. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! You know that one's true. We felt that one. Oh, I don't know. You know that's true. Not every person, of course. Not every person. But come on, let's be real. Let's get real. You're the only one. I'll even make it deeper. You're the only one that can awaken in your world. You're the only one that can be awake. Because it's only your consciousness that can actually become aware that you are the one watching all of this. Everyone else is just being whoever is needed to be to help you become more of who you're meant to be. And when you don't, when you don't ask anyone or insist anyone to be awake, and you don't get into these weird conversations like with your partner, like they need to do these dance moves and you got to do these dance moves and then we're going to get it right, then you can actually relate to people. I remember I had a dialogue with a woman, and, I, and, and again, I'm always coming from a place of love, but sometimes we have to get real. And I said, Matt, what is the spiritual reason for why my partner doesn't listen to me? I said, the spiritual reason is that they don't give a shit about what you're saying. <laughs> and if you could start saying things that match what they think, they would probably listen more often. And she said, but I don't, I don't live by what my partner thinks and I don't want to say those things. Well, you should find a different partner then. Because you're in a relationship with someone who gives a shit when you say things that matches more of what they believe and when you don't, they stop listening. And she said, but what if I just accepted my partner? I said, what if you accepted that this is now your ex? <laughs> That'd be better. Get real. Get real. Right, you sit down, you start talking about your day, and your partner is just doing this. Well, that was nice. That was nice. See you next lifetime. You're the only one in your world who needs to be awake, and you're the only one in your world who can be awake. And when you go to family functions, I tell a lot of stories about my family functions, derive a lot of fun material from my family functions. I'm going back in December to see my family because I would like some more material. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually looking forward to going. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be lovely. And I'm going to come back with some stories, I guarantee it. But you can go to family functions, and you don't have to age regress back to being 12. Because you can be co-opted by someone else's ego, and your ego is trying to co-opt them to become more like your spiritual self. No, no, no. Let's make this gangster. They don't need to hear about your spiritual ideas. They don't need to do anything more spiritual. You are the one playing the game of awakening. And your job is to go and be your clearest, most loving self. And if you're around them first five minutes, you feel great. It's going well. Namaste. Love and light. This is good. And then all of a sudden, you start getting that little... Mm, mm. Mm. Right? The egos of your family just start chiseling away. Little comments, little comments. Little comments. Little funny comments. Right? Like someone goes, hmm, you go, what? First of all, here's a clue. To not open up a can of worms, anyone, anytime someone in your family makes a noise, don't ask what. Because it's going to be shitty. They go, hmm, what? And they say, I just thought you said you were working out. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to gangster land. I actually once had that experience, you know, and as a lot of you know me from my teachings, but obviously I had, I've had various incarnations in this lifetime before I was a teacher, you know, and, and funny enough, it's funny, I talked about this at a retreat once about how I used to be, and people thought it was a joke. It was very lovely, because I used to be a personal trainer. I actually used to be a bodybuilder, to be honest. 
I, that's not a joke, that's true. And I used, when I was in, in, in high school, I was the smallest kid in school, both in height and size. I was 98 pounds. And when I got in, and I had never played sports because I had asthma, and I never knew my body would respond to lifting weights. And I started lifting weights, and in eight months, I went from 98 pounds to 160. And I, became, and I was actually looking at competing in bodybuilding because it became like a sport that I really resonated with. And then I got into, you know, I got my back injured and I went through a healing crisis and I said, universe, if you heal me, I'll serve your will. And after two years of having a debilitating back injury of epidural shots and uh, my back was healed in 10 seconds when I said that and I was activated as a healer. And when I went through Kundalini Awakening, I gained some extra weight to ground myself. And so I went from being this guy with shredded abs and walking kind of like a gorilla, <laughs> you know, which, you know, when you lift weights, it's what you do, right? You start building muscle and you think, I need to start wearing child-sized t-shirts. <laughs> I need my clothes to look like a wetsuit. <laughs> like my shirt is made out of Spanx material. And I remember I went to a family function, someone, hmm, I went, what? And they go, I just, you know, I just remember you as someone who used to work out a lot. And I went, yeah, yeah, totally. I used to look really different. I used to have shredded abs and I was buff. And now my body is kind of like a food truck map of Seattle. <laughs> Here's where to get a burger, check out the nachos, try the pretzels, you know? And I said, yeah, I just remember you just looking a lot better last time I saw you. And I thought, thank you for caring about me. Thank you for caring. You're telling me this because you're saying that the way you saw me used to be healthier. And you're saying that because you're trying to guide me back to health. Thank you. And they said, I don't know if that's what I was saying. And I said, no, no, that's what you're saying. That's what you're, that's what you're saying. That's what you're saying because we're about to have a problem and I don't want to have a problem. I'm spiritual now, but that's what you're saying. <laughs> you're the only one who needs to be awake in your reality, which means you're the only one in which whose narrative you need to pay attention to. And you have to make sure that the way in which you're choosing to look at something is the most supportive to you and the most compassionate to someone else. Because self-support and compassion for others is the very thing that people that trigger you don't embody. So you have to be unlike the people that trigger you to be able to shine a light that uplifts them instead of lets them drag you down. You're the only one in your reality who needs to be awake. What's the second koan? And this is, a, I'm going to say it, and it's going to sound very misleading, and then I'll unpack it. The second one is, the world is as awake as you are. And if you remember what I said, behavior rooted in consciousness, heroism, inspiration, is a sign of how integrated someone's consciousness is. So when you see other people acting ridiculously, there is consciousness within them, but it is fueling an ego agenda. But when you are awake as consciousness, it means you are aware that the battery that fuels your breath is rooted in wisdom, love, unity, and forgiveness, and mercy. And that same energy is awake in other people, even the people treating you like crap, that consciousness is there. It's just being twisted and convoluted into an egoic agenda, which simply means they're not ready to become self-realized and responsible for their behavior. So just because people act ridiculously doesn't mean those people are not consciousness. It means they're not conscious that they're consciousness, which means they're unintegrated expressions of divine potential. They are potentially her heroic while acting certifiably villainous. But when you say that's not consciousness, 
If you say that's not consciousness, you're choosing to deny the consciousness in you. So you're looking, the world in view that you see, the world in view is a conscious world, a world that is coming into consciousness. And you are the consciousness that is watching your light wake up in other people. And when people mistreat you, you go, hmm, that is waking up in this person at a rather slow rate, isn't it? Everything is consciousness. Not everyone is conscious of it or integrated into that liberated expression of divinity. So when you look at the world and you go, oh my God, this world is crazy. No, what's happening is consciousness is waking up in people who haven't decided to choose it. And you're watching their egos run for cover and try to manipulate it into something more pleasurable to their conditioning. The world is not brimming with fear. The egoic world is fighting for its life. And the people that mistreat you are fighting the salvation of their own expansion by hiding and trespassing in your field just to have something to pick at. And when you hold a space that says, I may not like how they are, but I understand, you make it harder for them to pick at you. Because how can an ego pick at you when you don't see separation between you and them? When you say, here's what makes me me and this is what makes you you, you've now become separate and now you can have an enemy, an antagonist, an adversary. Someone opposes you, you don't oppose them. And the easiest way is you just have to develop the ability in a, on an authentic level to be interested in someone who is exhibiting uninteresting behavior. When someone has a problem with me, which doesn't happen very often, I'm blessed to say I get a lot of very positive attention. But if someone had a problem with me, my job is to be interested. Is what they say going to benefit my life and change my life in a positive way? Probably not. Is it going to be something that's going to help me grow and expand? I don't know. Let me listen and see. But my ability to be interested in someone is giving my attention to their consciousness so that while they're sharing whatever feedback they're going to say, my job is to accelerate their evolution. Because you accelerate someone's evolution by not slowing down and stunting your growth. Be interested. You chose to be with your family on a given date. You're already going to be there. So you either get in your car and leave, or if you stay, be interested. Being interested is how you get real with people without needing them to get real with you. No one can get real with you. You could only get real with yourself. And you can be real or get real with someone else, even if they're in an illusory fantasy. The biggest distraction, especially when it comes to spending time with family, is if they could only see it my way. If they could only know what I know and see what I see. That's the trap. They don't need to see it your way, only you do. And the codependent pattern in you needing someone to see something, on the surface it seems really mindful. I just want them to see this in consciousness so they can stop hurting. But there's actually a little bit of an insidious manipulation in that. Because the truth is you want them to see it differently because when they feel better, you're going to feel better around them. And it's actually about you in a weird way. Which is why they, in their ego, which is God dressed up as the ego, pretending to be unconsciousness, is fighting you. 
because it's God's way of saying, hey, don't try to wake up that character. That character's waking you up. And you say, oh, I'm already awake. Apparently not. <laughs> That's why when you hear teachings like there is no other, there's only one, what it's really saying is stop trying to change people. And if you don't like the way people are, leave. Move. Or say, hey, I would look like it if you did this differently. Oh, I'll do that. And then repetition shows you. They're not going to do that. What are you going to do? Get real. The hero's journey only needs one option. And if you're somewhere you don't want to be, what's the one option? Go. Anywhere else. And choose the inspiration of consciousness. A consciousness where you're the only one that is to be awake in your world, and the world is as awake as you are. So when we're on our keyboards, typing things and talking about the world and blow the world and all this stuff, realize that what, nine times out of ten, when your ego is making a grandstand point about the world, you are doing it in a moment where the things you're talking about are not existing. And social media is just a great place to see this. No one but you will awaken in your world, and the world is as awake as you are. And I'll give you an example of this in my own life to really make it more real. My sister and I have a wonderful relationship now. And she knew me, you know, when, when, I, when, I, was, when, my, when I was growing up, my sister is 10 years older than me. And so by the time I was a kid, my sister was already kind of in high school. So I was kind of raised as a single child in a lot of ways. I knew my sister, but she kind of came and went because she was, you know, she had a car and doing the teenage thing. And when I became an adult and my, the first identity that I think my sister recognized, well, the first one was when I was a, when I was a teenager, I, I was in entertainment. I was an actor and was in a singing and dancing group. And I did a lot of performing and I have actually been a performer since I was eight years old. Not realizing that all that was training to do this. <laughs> to do this show. And then I got into bodybuilding and personal training, and you know, and I understand my sister's point of view, like, oh my God, he's an actor, and then he's a singer, he's a dancer, and now he's a bodybuilder. Like, I was my own village people. <laughs> like, what are you this week, Matthew? And then I had the healing crisis. I go, hey, Shannon, I used to be an entertainer, an actor, then I was, then I was a performer, and then I was a bodybuilder. Now, I'm a psychic superhero. <laughs> and I became my sister's weird spiritual brother. Because every so often, I became a new version of myself. And I'd go to family functions. And you know when you go to a family function, and there's this energy in the air, and you kind of, you taste the energy, and you go, I think this is the energy of, y'all been talking about me behind my back. <laughs> You know that energy? Where like everyone, shh, don't, don't say, he's coming, don't, don't say anything. But, but, but the energy is still in the air. The residue, the fog of the judgment is still in the airways. You could feel it, right? And the tip off is you go through the front door and, hi, hey, look who it is. And everyone's exaggerating and overacting. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? You guys are talking about me. Oh my God, what's going on? And no one said anything, but I felt like I was my sister's weird spiritual brother. And people in the family would ask me questions, trying to be very normal. So, so what's going on in your life, Matt? Your sister tells us that you're into spirituality. Yeah, I'm working as a healer now. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> and are you able to make a living doing such incredibly fictitious fake things <laughs> that I have not been trained to accept as reality? How's that going? 
pretty well. <laughs> pretty well. Pretty real. And every time I would spend time with my family, I always had this little voice inside of me that said, it doesn't matter how they act, it only matters how you respond. And that's the game I played. And function by function, I played the character of I'm your weird spiritual relative. And little jabs and little jeers were all standing in line, getting samples of the food at the buffet. And, oh my god, oh my god, I took too much coleslaw. How unspiritual of me. And people ask me ridiculous question is if I put a cup down without a coaster, is that unspiritual? And I just sat back and I thought, I'll give you that. That's okay. My time will come. <laughs> My time will come, people. <laughs> and I focused on, it doesn't matter what they say, it only matters how I respond. If I'm choosing to be in this location, I'm just going to focus on responding with kindness and love. And there were many times I had to go in the bathroom and I would just sit there and do I love yous. And sometimes I'd cry a little bit and I'd feel like, wow, I am like a spiritual Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> and Santa Claus, I'm ready to lead your sleigh tonight. <laughs> I'm so tired of all the other reindeers who used to laugh and call me names. who, by the way, never let poor Rudolph play in their reindeer games. <laughs> Even though I was at Hanukkah parties. <laughs> but I always like Christmas better. And, year after, and then what happened was, all of a sudden, something shifted. I went so deep in my journey. In the very beginning of my journey, I was an activated healer, and I thought, I have so much to offer the world, I don't know how to get what's in here out to the world. I don't have a platform, I don't know what to do. And I just walk around my neighborhood blessing people. I thought, no one's coming to me as a light worker, so I'm gonna bring the light worker to the world. And I would just bless, 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 bless. I'm the only one who has to be awake, bless, bless, bless. And then all of a sudden things started happening, an audience started to come, four people in my living room for my first event. Whether or not they were there just for the potluck, I have no idea. <laughs> and then it built and it built, and then as it started to expand, it was still the outer layers of my infinite self represented by my family, still representing the old guard of the old belief. And I'd bump up against it, I'd bump up against it. And then one day something really, really strange happened. where everyone my sister knew, it seemed, would ask her, is Matt Kahn your brother? He's amazing. And I just did what I needed to do enough times where all of a sudden I became I guess successful enough, popular enough, where all of a sudden it didn't matter what they did and didn't believe religiously or about the gifts that I have. It was just, oh, you're actually someone. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> and then my niece, who was in college at the time, was in finals and her sorority sisters were trying to find peace during all the stress and were passing around inspirational quotes. And then my niece says, wait a second, that's my uncle. Your weird spiritual uncle? <laughs> and all of a sudden, the field opened up. And it wasn't just you treating me as the light that I shine. It was that I had shined my light so bright that the people who thought they knew me from my earlier years were forced to forget how they defined me. And that was when my time came and I, it's the same people of my family who used to say really, really snippy, snide, snarky remarks to me, who would go, we are so proud of you. Is that right? Thank you so much. 
thank you for that. Wow, it feels, and I would thank you for your support. Thank you so much. Meaningless. Meaningless. Because there's only one thing I have ever needed to be supported by, and that is the power of my consciousness. It is my guide, it is my guardian, it is my companion, it is myself, it is my everything, it is what you are right now. Rely on that. And that has one option in every moment, and you follow it. Because you're eventually going to get to a place where the intensity of not choosing something unknown is more painful than continuously repeating this rerun of an existence. You want a season premiere? Choose differently. And rely on your consciousness. Befriend your consciousness instead of vilifying the conditions in other people as if they owe you anything. My family doesn't owe me anything, and it's wonderful that they support me. I love them dearly. But it wasn't their support that got me here. It was my consciousness that got me here. When no one knew my name, and I'd speak at New Wren Books in Portland, or East West Book in Seattle, and I'd say things that was of the new paradigm before people knew what a new paradigm was, and people would say, I just don't know what he's talking about. And I'm in this catch-22 where if I say something challenging in the old days, they would sit there and go and question and doubt and go, I just don't know that that's even right. But then if I say the things that they actually believe, they walk away and go, that was nothing new and special. <laughs> Screwed either way. So I have the tendency of going on stage in front of people being very nice and kind and making things very weird. And then we all came together and created the love revolution because it was your evolving consciousness with my evolving consciousness and we met in the middle and we say, let's change this place for the better. In order for all of us to really dive deep into the awakening of our consciousness and integrate it and let the one inspired choice lead you from one breath to the next, the only thing that you rely on is your consciousness, which is your awareness translated through your senses. And in every moment, everything's giving you clues. You see something and you don't know why, but your consciousness says, pay attention to that. There will be a quiz. <laughs> pay attention to that. You ever had that moment where something happens, you don't know why you're paying attention, but you're like, I, I need to pay attention to that. And what you're often paying attention to is your consciousness is zooming in on people's unconscious behavior, and it's through the language of silence saying, do opposite. Be unlike that. So if you can learn to be unlike the people that hurt you the most, and more in alignment with the one inspired choice that leaves you no option but to do the most courageous, loving thing in every moment. No matter how unpopular it makes you in your circle, no matter how many people dump on you, no matter how rejected you feel, you're on a vision quest right now. And it is leading you nowhere else but into reuniting with your eternal consciousness. And when the consciousness or energy source in you doesn't have to be wedged through the filter of egoic conditioning, you are then free to express and focus your light and to co-create a more magnificent reality through the journey of inspiration, which occurs through the simultaneous death of competition and comparison. And that is why we're here because we're already on this journey. We're steeped in this journey, and if you feel the energy of the world, we're at this place where people are either waking up at record speed, or there are now more ways than ever to go back to sleep. 
And even if you go back to sleep, you're not going to lose the consciousness you've cultivated. You're just going to put it on pause until you wake up again. So you don't lose anything. It's just kind of like when your phone goes into sleep mode. And when we are really lost in the fear of missing out, when you step back and look at that, you find yourself making a lot of repetitive choices where the one thing you're actually missing out on is the adventure that you've been prepared to take for infinite lifetimes, which is to look the, at the way the world acts and chooses and for you to carve your own path in a direction no one has explored. I humbly sit on stage with you, offering you teachings, transmissions of energy, and a way to interactively heal, awaken, and integrate the light of your soul in ways the world has never seen as possible. There are things that I do with you that people don't understand how it even happens, because I'm bringing through rather sophisticated and advanced levels of processes and healings from high dimensions to shift the morphogenic field, which means to give the world an opportunity to know the kind of consciousness that can be embodied, which then gives other people the opportunity to pop into that alignment as well. We are changing the game. We are shifting a brand new paradigm. And we are carving paths and directions no one has explored because we've been trained through infinite lifetimes for this journey, and the one thing we didn't come here to do is the same old thing again. We came to celebrate ascension before we can see and confirm it, and we came to be aligned in love no matter how anyone else thinks, acts, or behaves. And it doesn't mean that the people who are acting the way they act and the people that have done things aren't going to be held accountable for it. But the merciful universe looks at people who act the way they act, and there's no punishment handed down. There's just an extreme trajectory of transformation. And if you could let go of the responsibility of needing to make sure the people that have hurt you are dealt with in justice, and focus on the only justice, which is you're the only one that needs to be awake in your world, then you will raise the vibrational frequency of the world you inhabit and abolish the ability for anyone to use their hurt to hurt other people. That's justice. And that is what we are creating and expressing as the love revolution. Where we're at on the planet is such a pivotal turning point. In order to anchor the kind of light, love, peace, and oneness that is going to truly uplift this planet, we cannot get lost in the games that other people are playing. And the reason we get lost in these games, and I'll use this point to tie it all together, is because we have a tendency to entrain with the vibration of people who are acting out the lesser qualities than what you already embody. And it's because when you were a child and you were already a naturally awake being but not self-realized in that awake, you looked at other people who were finding joy in things that you didn't understand and you thought you were being left out. And you thought if I could be more like people, I'd be better liked by people. And you went to sleep and went into the play. And you did it purposely to wake back up. You've already started to wake back up. Don't go back to sleep. Let everyone else do what they're going to do. You're the only one that has to be awake in your world. Because consciousness is everything. The everything that you are when you allow the deepest truth to guide you forward no matter the risk or cost. In following my spiritual path from a very early age, what have I lost? I've lost track of the hell I used to live in. 
I've lost sight of the ways in which I was conditioned to act like the family that didn't know any better. I don't know where any of that went. And in exchange for losing that, I gained access to myself. The only one who could ever awaken on this planet. The only thing I will ever need. And the only thing I could ever rely on. We come together in relationship in the beginning, things seem awesome, and all of a sudden when life says, and you're done with this soul contract, and people will do whatever the play needs them to do to get them away from you. Betray, deny, lie, cheat, it's all storyline. And all it comes down to is, I guess that's the way the universe needed to have it play out for me to walk away. Just wake up. It's not actually personal what's happening. But until you realize that, it's very personal. And I tell you that because I spent 30 some odd years of my life taking every second of my life personally. And all I knew to do was make it more personal and more personal, more personal until the pressure of that broke me open. And now that I am here, and if I am here, I am but a reflection of the consciousness in you that is here. So now that we are here, we are the living proof that all is truly well because you are the only one that needs to be awake in your reality and the world is as awake as you are. The actions of the world does not reflect the unconsciousness of your behavior, but the battery and the operating energy that is your consciousness is the same energy source of other people. And we're all at different levels of realization, actualization, embodiment, and integration much compassion and love for other people. Most times you're not going to be the one who is meant to wake someone else up. You will only inspire their awakening by you waking up. So let us be loving. Let us be clear. Let us be courageous. And let us be fierce. Because we are the love revolution a revolution is well underway, but it's not a revolution of opposition. It's a revolution of immaculate inclusion. Who's with me?